Hey, Nancy. Good morning. Hi, Wade. How are you? I'm great. Um, it's so it's so nice to hear your voice. I feel like it's been ages. I know. I think the last time I heard your voice is when I saw you in person at Pre- I know, like six months ago in LA. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, Leo. How's hey, it going? how's it going? Great. How are you all? Hi, Leo. Yeah. Hi. Just doing well. Um, just going to wait a couple minutes for some folks to trickle in and I'm going to post a tweet. Um, I know Sasha is going to be joining us a few minutes late today. So we'll just dive right in and in just a couple, I'm going to pin some tweets for everyone to take a look at um, and we'll be right back. Okay, cool. Um, well, again, thanks both of you for, for being here this morning. Um, this is super exciting because in a lot of ways, I think, um, especially between, you know, Nancy and Leo, there's a lot of, um, I think, alignment um, aesthetically in terms of the kinds of ideas that you're trying to access um, and the way that you're trying to tell stories with light and color. Um, so, you know, really, um, so, you know, really excited to dig a little bit more into that. Um, yeah, today, as we as we chat. Um, let's kick off maybe um, just by talking a little, just by, you know, we're here today, of course, talking about Leo's uh, Cosmic Bloom. If you check out the pin tweet at the top, um, you can see a video preview from our London installation of the work. Um, it's a generative series coming soon to Outland, um, and it's an evolution from um, Cosmic Reef, which was uh, Leo's first series with Artblocks that was released earlier this year. Um, Leo, I, you know, I understand that there's a little bit of that there's a little bit of a, a larger framing to the series that has you know come come out recently you've been developing I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about that if it's not too soon sure um, well I you know had this kind of crash course I guess in you know sort of what is what are nfts what is generative art all these sorts of things last year and um, it was really it was very thrilling to to, to find that this medium and, um, and we created a cosmic reef, but I always thought of it as thought of it as sort of a, it felt like, uh, my early interest was in virtual reality. And I always think of these things as being immersive and creating a space that people can be inside of and almost like as, as, a, as worlds, each one is its own world. Uh, but then I felt like, well, there's more to do with this. And, uh, we now are on to cosmic, to cosmic bloom, which has a, an aesthetic it's it's related but different and uh we're putting it all under the umbrella of the cosmologies is what we've come up with so it leaves room for other things to develop and i'm you know i have to take take things sort of step by step um and we're sort of deep in the birthing process of cosmic bloom um so i'm not sure what the future holds but i'm excited that this umbrella you know sort of revealed itself and uh and we'll see where it takes us well, we're excited to go on the journey, um, you know, you know, and thinking through different kinds of cosmologies and, you know, cosmic interactions. I mean, and when I say cosmic, I don't also mean on the macro scale. I also mean, you know, on a micro scale, something, you know, just about us being in this space is cosmic in the, in the sense that we're out here in the universe. Um, I've pinned some additional tweets to the to the top of the chat. Um, you can check out also showing um, some of Nancy's recent works. Um, Nancy, congratulations on your show. Um, Nancy, congratulations on your show at Vellum in Los Angeles. It looked fabulous. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, yeah, about the show and about about that work. Yeah, I'd love to. And I, I want to just start by saying, you know, Leo, I've, I've had the privilege of really looking at your work, taking a little bit of a deep dive. And I, I just think it's truly sort of transcendent. And so I'm really excited to be in conversation with you about this because I also um, have roots in VR and I'm really interested in a lot of what immersive art can afford, what immersive art can afford in terms of embodied consciousness. And, and when we talk about cosmologies, you know, how those cosmologies work with our, with our bodies, literally with our physiognomy. And, and so the Slipstream show that I just um, opened, it was a, a solo show in, at Bellum LA. And it was a series, it was basically a series of 10 discrete immersive videos which were, which I really considered a book. So they were each a chapter 
in a book. And the book, of course, was a book based on Slipstream. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Slipstream, the genre of Slipstream, traffics in the strange familiar and the familiar strange, which felt very fitting if we're talking about cosmologies for the moment that we're in. Um, but it really is a, a kind of investigation of, of mutated truths, um, storytelling, and pushing into the boundaries of what might be possible in terms of storytelling and how we un even understand or conceive of literature through digital technology and through these immersive technologies. So I really, I did a lot of experiment. Uh, I worked experimentally in this series. I dabbled a little bit with GPT-3 in a few cases. And for each of the chapters, I actually wrote my own um, chapters. I actually wrote my own, um, they were sort of fake excerpts from each chapter. So I wanted to kind of further layer to, into sort of new uncharted territories. So I'm really interested in, in what's possible when we work at scale, when we um, play with certain cinematic techniques that are unorthodox and what, you know, what that communicates and what it opens up potentially really, um, generally, obviously in my case, through the lens of abstraction with, with, a viewer, with viewers. Yeah, that, that work looks amazing and it is um, yeah great to meet you here and uh, uh, I, I definitely admire what you're doing and, and your work in public art and all these things I think is really super exciting um, and I think it's um, there is so much possibility um, it feels to me like you know it's all wide open and there's so much to do in this space um, and I think it's you know when you say it's scale I, I find that to be super interesting because I love what I'm doing and you know, the generative art world and, you know, space and being able to make things that can be transmitted and viewed, you know, in a purely digital form. But I do consider myself very much a sculptor and I can't help but want to like, can't help but want to like, uh, you know, specify how these things should be viewed and create specific LED arrays and displays. And um, so I, I am immediately doing, doing that. And what's interesting to me is Cosmic Reef and Bloom are resolution independent, so they can scale. And, and, and um, you know, because it's code, it's all being rendered on the fly and uh, it's not recorded, which is so exciting. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it, there's all kinds of possibilities, you know, for me. And I feel like the, the work we've been doing, you know, we've been learning a lot about 3JS and usually we're using much, you know, higher powered tools and uh, you know, touch designer and all these other things, but in the in the realm of <clears throat> generative art, you know, it, you sort of have to use what you can do in a browser. And I've been astounded by what you can do in a browser. Um, and you know, I've always liked you know constraints and limitations, and and working with them and seeing what's possible. You know, I'm really it's interesting. You know, in thinking about you know, space and Nancy, you were talking about, you know, different kinds of cinematic framing and the, what I think is really interesting about Cosmic Reef and Cosmic Bloom is this ability to interact with the Z axis and you kind of press the Z key on the, on the artwork. I'll, I'll drop a tweet so that you guys can experiment with that as well. Um, but you immediately can kind of zoom in and get this multi-dimensional interactive view of the work. And Nancy, like you've done so much amazing work in augmented reality um, and all, you know, creating, you know, sculptural experiences in a different kind of mode, but, but both still grappling with the control that the user's interface has on, you know, on the viewing experience. And I was, yeah, I wonder if you could, you know, talk a little bit about, um, you know, grappling with that and, you know, creating, you know, meaningful presentation, um, you know, through these different kinds of adaptive constraints. That's such a wonderful, that's such a wonderful question. Thank you. And, and you know, Leo, one of the things I think is so interesting about what you just described is the way in which time plays such an interesting role in work that is not repeated. Um, and in the invitation to the viewer to participate and to actively engage. And I think that's really the promise of monumental large scale AR or to participate and to actively engage. And I think that's really the promise of large scale AR is that what it often does, um, because again, while it's not in my case anyway, generative or you know, dependent on, some, on, on, a, on an algorithm for its execution, it, it is, it's really never the same experience twice because generally when it's certainly for the larger geolocated um, artworks, 
you know, the conditions of that artwork, of the of the weather, of the environment, those those are never second to second, millisecond to millisecond, ever the same. And what I found is that when you can induce in the view, well, two th- I think there are two things at play. One is abstraction and the essential. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Sasha. Sasha's with us. Hi. Um, Don't let me interrupt. But sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I'm late. Oh, no, not at all. Um, the sort of, in my opinion, inclusive nature of abstraction um, but also the ways in which these larger scaled projects can, uh, you know, one hopes anyway, induce in the viewer a kind of ergonomic awe. And I think when we induce in the viewer a kind of ergonomic awe, and I think when we experience awe as a, as a, as a physiological reaction, we become open to um, a different type of sensory engagement. And so I think that that's, and Leo, certainly looking at your work, I can only imagine that that's, that that's at play, um, you know, as an experience. But also, you know, I would imagine that has something to do with when you, when you do scale up, that that's part of um, the opportunity. And certainly that's been my experience, as I say, with, with augmented reality and the ways in which people, viewers, tend to write themselves into that text. It becomes um, a kind of unconsciously performative experience. And in some cases, a quite literal performative experience. So people will literally, you know, record themselves engaging with the work in ways that are just wildly inventive and surprising. And I, I think that that's, speaking of generative, one of the, one of the, to use it differently and to use it slightly, to use it differently and to use it slightly inflected differently, uh, you know, one of the, the beauties of this type of, this type of public engagement. Um, yes, I, you know, I, I, I love creating the, the open-endedness that, that abstraction creates is interesting to me. And, you know, I feel like we're su- surrounded by so many technologies that haven't, you know, they want us to go somewhere or do something or buy something. It's this thing you're on rails all the time. And I, I hope that by, you know, seeing my, my work, people don't, don't get that sense. It's open-ended and you can make of it what you want. And it's not, there's no beginning, middle or end. You, you kind of relieve the, the viewer's anxiety because you walk in and, well, did I miss something? And no, you didn't because it's all happening now. <clears throat> and it's, it just creates a, a feeling of release in a way and, and that it's, a, it's, a, it's so different from the kinds of things we're normally surrounded by. Um, it's so different from the kinds of things we're normally surrounded by um, that it's really thrilling uh, to see that. And, you know, projects like the Bay Lights, which is on the, on the, the, the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, it's been, next year will be 10 years that the piece has been, that the piece has been up is, you know, it's just exciting. It's 25,000 LED lights on the bridge. And I mean, for me, the, I love the idea of VR and AR, but the actual dragging these digital things out into the real world and doing them has been really um, exciting. And, and um, I think just the ability for people to look at these things and to have an experience, and it does provoke a sense of awe and connection. And everyone's always talking about, oh, we want to, you know, create, you know, these community and all these sorts of things that are community and all these sorts of things that are really overused but to actually see that at work and and i think it is that 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 moment of when you create the sense of awe you kind of want to connect you want to connect with the person next to you whether you know them or not and talk about it and share it and it really binds people together in a powerful way yeah i think it actually is a is a a kind of co-creation and it is a spontaneous form of co-creation that's really exciting and i it you know you're right i I think that you know even VR and AR are mediated by, in, in one case, a heads, ke- headset and another, and in another case, the, uh, the screen itself. But certainly my experience with projection mapping has been, has been equally profound in that sense. You know, um, I, just recently in Los Angeles, down in Luminex, you know, we have this huge, you know, we have thing. And people literally ran toward the building as if to dive <laughs> into the wall, through the wall through this portal that's created. So I think that, um, <laughs> fortunately, no, no lawsuits, no injuries, but, but I do think that that's where there's a lot of um, sort of exciting potential that isn't, that isn't predicated actually on, um, on something that's handheld or, or attached to the body per se. Yeah. And, you know, how, you know, while we're on this, on this thread, I think, you know, something that, 
also that both of you are doing on a very, very large scale is you know, beyond, you know, interacting with different users, you're also interacting with the environment and the landscape and, you know, transforming it or augment, augmenting it in some way. Um, and so how, you know, do you think about in, you know, you know, relationships or, or forms of co-creating the experience of the viewer? How do you also, you know, think about integrating your work into, you know, the world? Well, I think there's a lot of responsibility um, in doing this work. And for me, you know, particularly using, you know, uh, energy and, and, you know, we, we thought a lot about all the environmental concerns in San Francisco. And the fact that the piece uses less than $30 a night in electricity was, I, I felt very kind of proud of that in a way to make a piece that, you know, is 1.8 miles long. And um, it, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not much. And we, we offset that with another solar credit. Um, so I feel like, I feel like, you know, th that part to me is, is exciting. And in London as well, with the illuminated river, we, we were trying to reduce overall light consumption. Um, and it's very important to, you know, to think about these things and, um, try as much as possible to be as efficient, um, as, you know, as we can. Um, but I do, I think it. I mean, when you're putting something in the world, for me, I think I, I sort of want to, I really try to work with the site I'm working, I'm, I'm where I'm at. I'm not using like the bridges in London as a pedestal for my work. I'm trying to deeply integrate light into these, into the bridges to the point that people may look at it and not even know that an artist had done something with them. There's something about them that looks different, but it's really woven into it. And I think that there's that, you know, there's, there's so, you know, the world is so, it can be overwhelming with everyone putting their, their mark and stamp all over everything all the time um, that I just have really tried to deeply integrate and understand and talk to a lot of, you know, the, the, to, to anyone I could um, in London or in San Francisco to try and create something that felt really appropriate and tuned, create something that felt really appropriate and tuned and organic and in such a way that it just is, is kind of, revealing the beauty that's already there and isn't all about, you know, it's not like all about the piece itself. Yeah, I, I would, I would echo the sense of tremendous uh, gravitas and res responsibility. I would also add that, you know, I approach any public space with a, with, um, you know, a sense of, of sensitivity and also intentionality. I, I don't do any of these things uh, haphazardly, nor do I do them without consulting with community members, people who might be affected by it. I mean, the beauty of uh, augmented reality, of course, is that it's an opt-in experience. You are not technically disrupting the flora and fauna of that space, other than, you know, like, let's take desert, the Desert X Biennial, for example. You know, you do have people driving out there to experience it, but at the end of the day, you're not digging up any soil, you're not um, you're really not altering the landscape in any way other than, you know, inviting people to bring their bodies to that space. But I think particularly with work that is as charged as mine is sometimes, either conceptually or politically, um, there's, there are additional considerations around who this artwork might impact, who might, there are additional considerations around who this artwork might impact, who might be, um, you know, feel invited to the conversation and really trying to cover that all of those bases that as, as, as Leo, you were saying, it's not just a matter of kind of, you know, coming in from on high and, and dropping in your experience because that's just what the world needs. No, it's, it's, it's part of a larger conversation. And I love this idea of embeddedness that you would embed the work in a larger conversation, in a larger ecological conversation, and in a larger conversation around sight. And one of the things on that note that I know I've talked about ad nauseum um, on a number of occasions, but you know, when I first started doing this, some of this kind of guerrilla AR, these guerrilla AR interventions in 2018, you know, back when I founded the app, I have, I, I should have mentioned, I have an augmented reality platform called Fourth Wall. Um, I spoke to a lawyer um, and she said, you really need to be careful when you speak about this very sensitive subject of site activation or site integration, 
And, you know, because it will be policed, it will be monetized integration. And, you know, because it will be policed, it will be monetized. And so really try and speak more in the language of shared cultural thought space, which is, of course, unique to augmented reality, I would say. Um, but where does that where how might we harness that idea of this shared cultural thought space as a space that is both uncontainable and protected and contains all of that intentionality? Whoa, that's so much to unpack, Nancy. I'm re ready to dive in. Um, <laughs> I wanted to also, you know, I saw Oria in the audience and wanted to welcome her to the stage. I know that Oria has a big um, show today with Feral File that has released. Um, so congratulations, Oria, and welcome. Um, oh, thank you so much for inviting me up. Hey, guys. So congratulations, Oria. Hey, thanks. Congratulations. Yeah. So exciting. Yeah. <laughs> So we're talking about, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about public art and sculpt and sculpture, creating sculpture in relationship to um, both a public experience and a landscape, but also an individualized experience and the kind of uh, tension between interface um, and device and surface area um, between, between all of those things. Um, you know, and Sasha, maybe you have a slightly different perspective on this, um, you know, working you know, kind of collaboratively with, with with software in the way that you do. Um, and in also thinking about your compositions, not as sculpture, but as, as poetry. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is, I'm just sitting here in awe. This is so fascinating. And I'm a fan of um, the work of everyone up on stage. So this is really lovely. And I'm thinking both that there's so much that resonates um, in terms of my work with AI, my, my, my work with natural language processing and generative text and the creation of poetry using machines, but also um, kind of on the flip side of that, but you know, equally, I think, relevant to the conversation is a lot of the work that I do using elements of nature and creating um, coded poems and um, you know, creating messages in the landscape and using materials that are readily available to, um, to, to create, I guess they're kind of sculptures, although I, I wouldn't necessarily have thought of that um, as a term to use, but creating concrete poems and visual poems, um, you know, for example, in my analog binary code series where I'm, I'm literally coding, but I'm doing it not um, on a computer, not in the machine, but I'm doing it with uh, found objects in, in nature. So taking, you know, fruits that have fallen from a tree or, um, taking my finger and writing it in snow or, you know, whatever the case may be. But I think for me, like I play with both of those things in a, in a, in a way that I think has helped me relate in a deep way, both to, um, to Leo's work and to Nancy's work, just this play of, um, you know, between digital and physical, between, um, between the world around us that we can see and feel and touch and interact with. And then the, the kind of the layer above that, that's a little bit behind a screen um, and that maybe is, you know, it, it's not quite going to land on our fingertips the same way. So I think I really try to do, um, to do that as well um, and really kind of mix the, um, this practice of, um, of thinking about nature and technology as, as really being in conversation with each other. Um, and yeah, and I think you, you actually, I think you very kindly put, uh, pinned a few of really try to do, to do that as well, um, and really kind of mix the um, this practice of um, of, th of thinking about nature and technology as as really being in conversation with each other, um, and and yeah, and I think you, you actually I think you very kindly put, uh, pinned a few a few different things that were relevant to that. But I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about um, you know this idea of taking technology and creating. Um, projections and creating installations um, that engage with the world. And I think in a way I'm, I've, I've tried to do maybe not consciously, but I'm doing something that's a little bit flipped on its head um, and a bit flipped on its head. Um, and then I'm taking um, technology as the inspiration and then try nature in a way. So, you know, when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I'm coding poems, um, you know, with sunlight and wind, for example, I'm kind of just using, what's available without electricity as a source of energy and as the fuel for, um, for the algorithm, for the algorithm that's creating, um, you know, imagery and creating motion and movement and growth. Um, so I, I guess I'm really interested in all of that. 
And then on the other side, I'm, I'm as you say, working directly with, um, with large language models and with AI and really trying to figure out where I can take, um, you know, where I can take output from a machine mind, from a non-human co-author, and then weave my words together with it in a way. So I think, you know, it's always sort of a mix of, of, nature or something biological or something botanical or something more corporeal and then something that's more digital, whether it's like language, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's these natural objects that I'm sculpting, whether it's light moving through sun, you know, through, um, through the leaves of a tree and creating patterns. I think it's always a little bit of a, a dialogue between these two things. Wow, I love the. I mean, obviously, that I mean the connection between. Wow, I love the. I mean, obviously, that I mean the connection between um, nature and technology is a space that I, I'm completely fascinated with, and I, I, you know, I, I, I've been interested in rules <clears throat> from the very beginning, and thinking about John Conway's Game of Life, which is sort of the, the you know, the, the cliche. But still, those sets of rules are so simple and the patterns that emerge are so complex um, that I found that really fascinating, uh, the simplicity and that kind of key to, you know, this little set of rules that you'd swear you're looking at something under a microscope or in the cosmos. Um, And my goal, you know, was to uh, find my own rules, you know, was to uh, find my own rules and create my own sets of rules, Um, you know, and but things that felt really like organic and, you know, inspired by things we respond to in nature, whether it's the movement of water or, um, you know, the sunset or these things that are out there. But I guess my, my process is not to take a camera and try and record that or sample it in some way. It's really to kind of recreate it with code. And, um, you know, so I'm always looking at, you know, I was on top of the Bay bridge looking at the, at the water and doing a cable walk. And I, I kept thinking, God, I have to, you know, try and describe this to my programmer and how are we going to make these ripples and these shadows and these interactions with the atmosphere and all these things. Um, so I think it's, you know, and we found a way to, to be really improvisational with, uh, with code and, and, and I don't know exactly what's going to happen when I create my work. I, I, I like this idea of getting lost inside of it, trying lots of things, not knowing, um, but eventually kind of stumbling upon the, the solution. Um, so I think it's it's totally fascinating to me this this idea of of, of having a you know a, a AI collaborator or someone to work with because I'm I'm pretty you know I feel like I make these data sets and I find these things but I would love to say okay here's this data show me you know another hundred things that are you know take this and 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 something like that I think could be very interesting but I haven't quite found my way to that quite yet. I have to say yeah, I that's... think this is some oh go ahead. Oh no! I was I was just going to say I think there um, there's a lot of really interesting potential I think to take data and turn it into dynamic poetry using language generators, which is actually something I've been working on a bit. And there's a few other um, really interesting code poets who I think have also started exploring this area of translating messages from nature into um, something that a text that can sort of be um, collaboratively worked on. So. Yeah, but I'm 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 fascinated by obviously how you've been exploring this in lots of ways that have been so inspiring to me, and yeah, it's exciting to think about um, all the all the all the additional ways to push it thanks to advances. And yeah, but I'm 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 fascinated by obviously how you've been exploring this in lots of ways that have been so inspiring to me, and yeah, it's exciting to think about um, all the all the all the additional ways to push it thanks to advances in various aspects of AI. Sorry, Nancy, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's, 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 such, it's such like, no pun intended, loamy soil. I mean, I think there's so much to say about it. But first of all, I mean, I don't know if everybody's read James uh, Bridle's Ways of Being, but, you know, this idea that somehow we are separate from these computational um, devices, you know, when we all come from sort of the same, from sort of the same <laughs> explosion of elements is, is really sort of interesting. And, and so I, I mean, I look, a lot of my projects really use biomimicry as a source of inspiration, you know, looking at equitable systems, distributive systems that, that serve um, a greater good. You know, I'm really obviously um, interested in things like mycelial networks and the ways in which those can, I'm working on a project right now. I have a project at LACMA um, that is looking at 
mycelial networks and the points of overlap and intersection with Web3 technologies and how those might be deployed toward um, not just not just you know more equitable distribution of of resources, but also like how does that affect cultural preservation in terms of libraries and museums and that kind of thing. And even when you know I'm learning Houdini slowly but surely um, at my ripe old age. And, you know, just learning how to code fractals and the exhilaration of understanding how math itself is um, is a part of everything. I, I don't know. It's been it's been a really illuminating, eye opening and inspiring moment to think about the ways in which all of this is already interconnected and embedded. And it's just to me anyway, and perhaps I'm oversimplifying here, but it's it's an opportunity to collapse those things, to blend them, and to find new ways of express expressing them. I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like every time I learn some formula that can be applied in some really dynamic way to the simplest of objects or the simplest of of systems, I, I don't know. I feel this kind of, um, and there's no other way to put it, a kind of exhilaration and connection to not just the technology, but of course the world around me. So I, I don't know, I think that's really thrilling. You know, I love, Oria, I'm, you also, you know, Leo and was just, and Nancy were talking a little bit earlier about how they got their start, you know, in VR. And you know, you, you know, in, oh, Oria's gone. Um, <laughs> never mind. Um, uh, I think that, you know, I, there was something, Sasha, that, you know, I, in one of your pinned tweets that you talk about that I think is really fascinating. Um, it's this phrase, regenerative poetry. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more, more about, you know, what, what that means, um, and that you talk about that I think is really fascinating. Um, it's this, phrase regenerative poetry um and i was wondering if you could speak a little bit more more about you know what what that means um and you know how you try to approach that in your work uh sure um yeah so i guess the term regenerative poetry I, so i've been using it as a title for an ongoing series and it's um one of the series that I referred to earlier, but basically I'm taking a very low tech approach to creating algorithmic patterns. Um, basically, you know, taking, um, taking a, taking a material, putting it on the ground or putting it on a surface and then kind of watching how light um, interacts with nature and casts um, shadows um, on that surface and, and then capturing it in some way on that surface and, and then in some way. And the idea is to sort of create, a visual poem, something that looks and reads a computer generated piece. So things that you might look at as think, um, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't like looking too, too hard, maybe it, it was something that was made by machine. Um, but in reality, it's made um, purely by nature. And there's no other intervention other than me just kind of sticking a, a, a camera um, on top of it and filming it. Um, so it's obviously a play on the idea of generative poetry and generative art. And um, I think that's, you know, the, the idea of generativity um, is really familiar to me from years and years of poetry workshops where we, we talk about, um, you know, having a generative prompt or having a generative class or a session where, you know, the point is to generate poetry. And that's a term that's used all the time in that arena. And that I think is, you know, obviously um, kind of newly um, familiar and like newly popularized in in the art world in lots of ways. But I've spent a lot of time over the years thinking about um, poetry's relationship to to repetition and the fact that so much of poetry is rooted in, um, you know, saying something, saying something familiar but different and like using a lot of devices that, um, that repeat sounds or that repeat ideas or repeat um, different patterns in different ways. And, and, and then the, the similarity or the overlap between that and what's happening with so much of generative art, where you're taking the same algorithm, you're taking the same code, the same program and running it again and again. But every time it's run, there's a difference. There's a different interpretation, a different reading, a different sort of text emerges. So I think with regenerative poetry, I'm just um, trying to probe that a little bit and, and play with it. Um, in a way that's kind of wordless, but um, yeah, thinking thinking about you know thinking about the idea of of way that's kind of wordless, but um, yeah, thinking thinking about you know thinking about the idea of 
of growth and development and how meaning accrues through algorithmic repetition in nature and how that happens in poetry and how that happens in visual art. Um, and then I think, you know, to bring it back to, to Leo and Nancy's work, like in a concrete way too, um, I think it, was really explicitly meant to be a bit of an exploration of how to make a bit of an exploration of how to make digital art that wasn't damaging to the environment or that um, that actually celebrated the natural world in some way. So trying to trying to create an algorithm, trying to celebrate algorithms as they are in nature, and to show that algorithms aren't something that needs to be they're not something that needs to be um, digitized or run through some cybernetic system. That we're surrounded by algorithms and. We're, we're imitating nature when we create um, computational programs. It's, well, I think that's finding these things in nature, um, making those connections. I think it's just the way we see things. Um, and I mean, my, one of my favorite things is to kind of get lost inside these tools and this code and, um, when you mentioned coding fractals, I feel like I'm, I, in a way, creating these systems with, you know, with dealing with scale and feedback and geometry and all these things. And, um, and there's so many, like, literally hundreds and hundreds of parameters that I'm tweaking and layering multiple systems together. And at a certain point, your brain just sort of breaks and you can't really process what's happening anymore. I mean, you could try to break it down, but um, all of it starts to kind of blend into this new thing. And that's when I think it gets, gets really exciting. And you start to find, make these discoveries in there that you never could have, I guess you could have made it sort of in a, in a linear way, but I think it's letting those things emerge and not knowing exactly how you got there is, um, you know, is really exciting. And, and a lot of this, you know, for me, a lot of this artificial life stuff was very interesting and emergent behavior and creating these systems that, you know, is really exciting. And, and a lot of this, you know, for me, a lot of artificial life stuff was very interesting and emergent behavior and creating these systems that, you know, you let the code go and uh, give it a goal and then it comes up with some solution, but you look at it and you can't, there's no way for a human to understand how it could possibly solve that problem in the way that it did. Um, so I think we're off to a whole other uh, you know, this is obviously just taking off with, you know, AI and all these things that are happening now. But I think there's great potential for artists to engage with these tools. And, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm happy to see more and more artists using uh, digital tools and code and, um, and, and it being more of a day to day thing, because I think they're some, you know, some of the best, some um, most unbelievable materials that we all have. And uh, I'm just excited to see what people do with them. Something that I think, you know, like about all of this that really resonates with me is, you know, especially in thinking about this, this, this idea of regenerative versus just generative and, you know, about this, this, this idea of regenerative versus just generative. And, you know, is I think that it approaches this idea of solving problems or finding answers without, you know, reducing to like a solutionist approach. Um, it feels like a really you know, holistic and, and, and positive way of, of thinking about, you know, working in this ecosystem. Yeah, I was going to uh, wait, I, that really struck me too. And listening to you, Sasha and Leo, yeah, I think one of the things I really love is this idea of getting lost and, and, and sort of having those again, ba boundaries blurred. And one of the most effective, the most things, I mean, I think part of what I'm somewhat obsessed with is this idea of the, like the sort of ship of Theseus idea of like, when you have an iterative um, let's say an object that goes through a series of iter or, 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 or idea, even a series of iterations, what remains of the original? And that was really one of the core um, concerns of the slipstream series as well. You know, I start with a drawing on paper and then I tear it into these bespoke sculptures, paper sculptor sculptures, which I then pho photogrammetry. And th at every stage of their mediation, um, something is lost and something's gained. So there's this whole like, on almost like poetry, forgive me, Sasha, but this like poetry of mathematics that's additive and subtractive. And when, and, and so then where does the essence of that, of that, where does the essence of that, of that, of that original idea or object, where does it go and what of it remains at the end, in the end point? And there is no real end point, in my opinion. 
um, because we could get into a whole philosophical conversation about that. But I do think that this idea of of getting lost and sort of in some cases losing track of these moments, I've done some research on, there's a great book called Cloud Ethics, and it was extremely dense. But one of the things I took away from it is that you know, and there's this whole emphasis on transparency as it relates to algorithms, but that there's so much value in opacity as well. And I'm really interested in that opacity and in the opacity of, of what's sort of hidden when all these other factors are brought into bear as we create these, you know, these, these artworks. Um, and, and just one thing I wanted to add, both Sasha and Leo have talked about light. And I think light is such a speaking of like an elusive something that I don't know, it's to me, it's so uh, it's one of the most mysterious um, parts of physics, it's mysterious um, parts of physics that I can even think of. Um, but it's also core to my practice. And, you know, when we think about early cave paintings, because, you know, back to the sort of full circle to immersion, we think about cave paintings and the ways in which we as a species have been if not, I mean, who knows what, what the motivations were uh, in a sort of Paleolithic era, but, you know, seek transcendence on some level. And when we think about the role that light plays in that transcendent experience and that embodied experience in the fact that, like, you know, you can shine a contemporary light on a wall, on a cave painting of drawings, and they look, they look anatomically incorrect. They look Miss, you know, they look like chaotic in some cases. There, there are things that are inscrutable, things we don't understand. What are those striations? What are those marks? And then you walk past it in blackness with a torch and that incalculable magic and sorcery that occurs when you have this unpredictable element, which is to say the flicker of the firelight. Um, what happens in that exchange is just really, really compelling to me. And I think that that's as we three um, attempt to collapse these natural and quote unnatural systems. I, I don't want to call them artificial. Maybe we'll say synthetic um, that, that those, I'm ha this is kind of a, a little bit of a nuanced point, but that those moments of unexpected transcendence are probably, at least I'll speak for myself. It's certainly what keeps me coming back. Yeah, I think light is so potent and, I think of it as just being really sort of this primordial thing. And it's not about language. It's not about imagery. And, you know, this idea of like gathering around a campfire. Is so, you know, this is, and, and just that, that level I think is very interesting and it, it's, there's something universal about it. And I think it, you know, breaks down so many barriers and people just have the, an ability to engage. And that was, was intriguing to me, the power of light but then adding computation to the light and starting to sequence the light um, in different ways that um, we also as humans are we're attracted to light, but we're also attracted to pattern and can't help but decode things. And our, our brains are hardwired to do this. So you see something and you're trying to make sense of it. Like, what am I looking at? And I really like this idea of very small amounts of information. And I, I, I was deepened into this, all, all this VR stuff in the nineties and you know, if I only had this more powerful silicon graphics million dollar computer or this haptic device or this special chair or whatever it was. And then I realized, like, you know, I made a, a simple light sculpture with 16 strobe lights and uh, a microcontroller. And I, I was like, this is a million dollar computer or this haptic device or this special chair or whatever it was. And then I realized, like, you know, I made a, a simple light sculpture with 16 strobe lights and uh, a microcontroller. And I, I was like, this is way more interesting and powerful than all this massive amount of gear. Um, and, and the experience of all that VR stuff, you, you couldn't really share it with anyone. And you were kind of, you know, it was very lonely. You're in this like polygonal world and it's sort of empty. Whereas these, these light sculptures actually attracted people and people would gather around them and in the way they would gather around a campfire. Um, so I think the, the ability to, 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 to connect and, um, is, is, is really amazing. And it's something that, you know, I've been, you know, just really amazing. And it's something that, you know, I've been, you know, just exciting. It's been exciting to create public art that kind of activates and brings people together on that way. I remember reading, um, Charlotte Kent's article about your work, Leo. I think, I can't remember the title of the piece, but, um, there were really, there were some really beautiful observations about your use of light and, 
I, I, I'm trying to find the article now and of course I can't, but um, I just remember reading it and just thinking there were so many wonderful things she said there about it, you know, enlightenment and just light as a metaphor, light, you know, as source of energy and fuel and so many of the things you, you know, you've just said, but um, yeah, it just reminded me that that article was such a beautiful one. And I was, I was going to say, um, I think the first probably one of the first poems that I ever wrote that was explicitly about technology had something to do with um, like sitting in front of a screen and being bathed in blue light and just kind of feeling that connection with the machine coming from this, um, this, this kind of feeling that connection with the machine coming from this, um, this, this emanating like force. Um, And it's something that I think a lot about, like the, I don't know, that there is some kind of an interactive field that emerges like from a scourges, like from a screen, because you're, you're painting in light and you're not painting in colors in terms of pigment, the way a traditional painting is painted. But I think a lot about making um, a multimedia poem and I'm, I'm creating it on a screen and it's, you know, my, my, t- my typical, my typical uh, aesthetic, I would say is like a, maybe a black background and then bright colors coming off of that. And, I, it's not something that I really intended at first, but what I realized is when I was projecting these poems on screens or on walls, or they were kind of living in space, that the light that was glowing um, because of that like became this extension of the poem in a way that you would never have on a physical page. And it was really interesting like how that kind of changed the, the experience of the poem. And it also made me think a lot about, um, and this is actually one of the motivations for for the regenerative poetry series but I remember reading about how um, you know back in the olden days before the advent of written language when people were reciting um, poems around these campfires and creating these paintings on the walls of caves that the the images in the caves were not actually just static images they were that the the images in the caves were not actually just static images they were being animated by the flickering of the of the campfire light and it was created and it was, you know, creating a sort of immersive experience in a way that we probably um, don't identify as being very high tech, but like, it's not, you know, that in theory at its essence, it's not that different from a lot of the things that we're trying to do now. And I just, I really like thinking about that link through and just about how light creates that kind of interactivity and just the through line of, of yeah, how we've, how we've tried to play with light in that way over time, I think is really, um, is really fascinating. That's like pre-cinema. I mean, to me, that's, it, it, that's exactly what it is. And that's, that was the condescension of the contemporary moment that like, oh, they didn't understand anatomy. And it's like, well, walk past with the flame. You'll see they understood it intimately um, and that it, it really, it appears to move. Um, it's very simple, but as you say, it's like, you know, you can you can throw all the technology at the world. It's 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 the same impulse toward that type of transcendent storytelling. I think. I think simplicity is really. I mean, I love simplicity. I think it's it's sort of deceptive. And I I start with really you know kind of dumb things like a pixel, and it's moving across the screen, and then it encounters, and you know, there's some rules for what happens, and um, you know, but once you have these simple rules, then, you know, make like, you know, a thousand of them or a million or, you know, however many and start to see what happens. And then this more, this complexity emerges out of that simplicity. Um, but I, I, I just, and I'm always going back to, you know, in, in, in cosmic bloom, it's really like starting with like a sphere or a cone or a torus or whatever it is and starting to work with that geometry and move it and create, relationships of like, well, here, we're going to replicate it around this axis or this other one and uh, start to kind of just these very simple operations. Um, But somehow out of that comes this really like very potent connection to something way beyond that is, um, you know, there's these sort of epic moments where suddenly I feel like I'm like, you know, looking at like a Turner or, you know, some some like, or, or Monet or whatever, these these artists that were really interested in capturing these experiences, you know, looking at like a Turner or, you know, some, some like, or, or Monet or whatever, these, these artists that were really interested in capturing these experiences uh, that were, that are abstract. And how do you, do you, do you, do you capture what you're seeing and transmit that to another person? Um, 
And I guess you know, you don't really know because it's the recept, you know, the way that people receive these things is so highly subjective. But I think there's a lot there. And I think it doesn't have to be like, I mean, I think there's already so much complexity everywhere that people really appreciate these simple things. That actually just made me think of something regarding public art again. Um, that I think is super important when we want to create experiences that are inclusive and accessible. And that is making the work leg legible. And by legible, I mean, you can have a work that is as layered and con conceptually rich uh, as you could possibly imagine, but it needs somehow to be able to be read, understood, appreciated, experienced by the broadest possible audience. Well, audience. And to do that, I think, um, simplicity is um, your greatest ally, your greatest asset. And I think that actually simplicity is quite difficult and um, it requires a kind of articulation that relies on a very, very deep understanding of the subject matter so that you could um, so that so that someone could walk that so that everyone walks away feeling that so that everyone walks away feeling as though they have gotten something out of it. And I at least that for me, that's something I consider every time I make a work, especially a, a, on a sort of monumental scale in public in public art. That is uh, one of my primary considerations and concerns. Yeah, accessibility is, you know, and and. I mean, that's something like throw people a ladder and let them engage. And, and I do think that, you know, as much as I love galleries and museums, you know, getting art out into the world, I think is so important. And it's exciting that cities are really engaging on the level that they are with these, you know, these monumental public art projects and these opportunities to really highly have people um, is, is, is very, very exciting. Um, but I do think, you know, anyone should be able to look at it and have a connection to it. Um, you know, and if, if you're a programmer, then there, there's all those other layers in there. Or if you're, if you're, you know, you know, an artist or an art historian, there's there's a bunch of things in there as well. I mean, it's all encoded and embedded in the artwork. Um, but I think it has these different tentacles and on ramps and on ramps that should really be engaging and uh, and really help. You know, the, the inclusive inclusive without you know having to. Uh, I think there are there there is more complexity there the more you get involved with it, but opening the door and kind of really getting people involved and 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 what what's interesting to me that with projects like the Bay Lights it, it was supposed to be up for you know two years and then it it did come down and there was an uproar and everyone said this we have to have this back this is part of our city and you know it really became embedded in the bridge and brought it to life in a way that when it wasn't there it was like something was really wrong something was missing. So it became like this presence that really had this, you know, life of its own. And so we were able to, you know, raise more money and put it back up. And um, but it's, it's been very interesting to me the way that the, you know, a lot of these abstract light sculptures can cr really create a deep sense of identity. And it's hard to describe because it's very different than like a logo or an advertisement or something like that. Um, but, it, you know, a lot of the materials I'm using are from the advertising world and used in Times Sing World and used in Times Square or Las Vegas. But removing that message completely from it, I mean, it's, it's still a, a very um, potent and seductive material. Um, but I think harnessing that, you know, in a different way is, is interesting and, and, and kind of repurposing it and then putting it back up, you know, as, as, as a gift to you know, to the public and, and, and letting people make of it what they want is, is quite interesting. I just, um, I just pinned at the top some of some links to the Cosmic Reef player um, that Leo and his studio created to allow folks to put, you know, you can put the token number for any of the Cosmic Reef editions um, and uh, experiment with your own composition. Um, and I love, you know, how and I think that also speaks a lot to the ethos of of Web three and the way that you know as soon as you mint an artwork it somehow it suddenly becomes public in the sense that it's on IPFS or whatever other storage protocol and you know people can access it from a link um, and you know just also but also you know creating this thing that is a tool that allows people an even easier access point to that is super super cool I definitely recommend everybody go and click through that a little bit it's beautiful.
it was, you know, the player or something. We created, you know, these 1,024 iterations of Cosmic Reef. And, um, and then we started to think, well, how can we display these? And um, we, we created this player that would allow you to stitch these multiple iterations together in kind of this seamless flow. And in a way, I felt like I kind of recreated my sculptural work through this process of, you know, these, um, you know, each NFT was its own unit. But then if you start blending them together and creating this longer continuum of them, and we, we decided, you know, at one point we thought, well, we could give this to the people who bought them. But then I thought, you know what, like, I really want it to be for everyone and let everyone enjoy it. And I think that's, you know, I see this big connection between what's happening in the, you know, in the, in the NFT and generative art space and public art in that, you know, anyone can go and see all 1,024 iterations of the work at full resolution anytime. And if you can get over this idea of ownership, it's, it's pretty amazing what we have access to. And I think there's a parallel to what's happening with public art uh, in, in uh, the, the NFT space and the way that it's just a very different model than, than anything we've experienced, you know, in the art world. Absolutely. And what do you think? What, I mean, I'd love to, you know, open this up to all the speakers. Like, how, how do you think that, you know, these different modes of access, like, how does this bode for the future of the art world? Um, or how do you hope to see, you know, things start to shift? Um, yeah, in your eyes. Well, there's, I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's obviously for the future of the art world. Um, or how do you hope to see, you know, things start to shift? Um, yeah, in your eyes. Well, there's, I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's obviously this is a big moment of disruption. And um, I mean, I've been doing this code, you know, work, working with code for over 20 years. So it's been, for me, I've been doing this a long time. And everything's sort of been happening around me, and um, but I'm I'm really excited to be in this space of you know these 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 breaking down some of these barriers and, and making things more accessible, uh, opening up these worlds to new audiences, having like you know lots of people becoming generative artists and being able to share their work with others, and it just feels like this very fertile time, um, and it's so exciting um, to be able to talk you know with, with you Sasha and Nancy about your your work and uh ways of of getting more out there in the in the in, in, in the realm of public art i love these ideas of, of poetry and and finding these these collaborators and um but it feels like a really very very exciting time i mean it's it, there are definitely some terrifying aspects of the world but i find hope in um in in finding the kind of the humanity in these things and harnessing these things and being able to make things for one another that we can all kind of contemplate, um, you know, the beauty of, of one another that we can all kind of contemplate, um, you know, the beauty of, of, of the world, whether it's, you know, uh, it's something you're actually seeing or some uh, reflection on it that's, that's created with LEDs and code or uh, screens or whatever it is. I think we're all trying to access something much deeper. Yeah, that, I mean that was beautifully said. Um, I would just add. I mean one one of the big one of the big reasons that I you know that I'm doing what I'm doing now, including not just my personal practice, but also my work as a co-founder of the Verseverse, which is um, a gallery that's dedicated to poetry NFTs and to experimentation with technological tools, is to bring more writers and you know more poets, but really writers and folks from that world to bring them over into this world a bit. When I started um, working with AI and I started actually doing independent research with um, with like a humanoid Android and then starting to learn more about natural language processing. I was rather intimidated because I come from a very um, language and literature focused background. I, I, you know, I didn't study computer science in school. I wasn't super technical. I was very interested in these more in more in more in terms of my relationship to technology and thinking about how technology has been shaping the human condition and kind of setting up um, you know setting us up for this transhuman moment or this posthuman future and thinking about that more philosophically. But I was I was rather intimidated by the idea of of jumping into the world of AI because I didn't see very many 
writers <laughs> were poets there at all. And I think that's one of the reasons why I felt like it was very important to do that and to, and to bring poetry and digital tools together in some way, because I think you need in some way, because I think you need, you need to have all sorts of people involved with the tools in order to build them in a way that's going to be helpful and valuable and for us go.